Dark Cast Network. Welcome to the dark side of podcasts. Hey y'all, this is Ash from Creepy Tapas Podcast. There are a few places selling stickers these days, but I found a small business on Etsy called Snarky Sticker Lady, and I am in love with her stuff. We all love snark around here on the Dark Cast Network. When I looked at the shop, I was surprised because she has some really funny stickers. The owner, Allison, knows that pride is not a sin, and she designed a line of stickers for friends of the LGBTQIA community. Allison has said of her own business... I love stickers. I love making stickers. I love putting stickers on everything. I started making stickers because I wanted some snarky, smart-ass stickers, and nobody had them. I need my sarcastic flag to fly, honey. So after making some snarky stickers, I started making lots of other types of stickers, too. As a loyal friend to the LGBTQIA community, I wanted some stickers to show how I feel, so I made them. Ha! Maybe you'd like to show how you feel too. All sticker designs are welcome in my shop. Just send your ideas in. All of Allison's stickers are vinyl and laminated, so they are water resistant and will last a really long time. Check her out on Etsy at etsy.com shop snarky sticker lady. Hey, but up boop boo, I want to get snarky with you, snarky sticker lady on Etsy. Hello, spooklings. I'm Jason. And I'm Kathy. And we're the hosts of the weekly podcast, All Hallows Eve Podcast. We are a husband and wife duo with a passion for anything spooky, macabre, and true crime, sprinkled with our own twist of comedy. We explore topics such as the history of Halloween, the Butcher of Plainfield, Hocus Pocus 2, urban legends, superstitions, and more. So come join us as we go down the rabbit hole that is All Hallows Eve Podcast. Listen and follow us at allhallowsevepodcast.com or your favorite podcast provider. Stay spooky, my friends. Hey, the following podcast contains dark topics, including murder. It also contains dark language. I like to swear sometimes because I'm a lady. Listen at your own discretion. Hey there, Rainbow Warriors. Welcome to Beyond the Rainbow, true crimes of the LGBTQ+. It's April, and no longer Women's History Month. It's also episode 2 of our new kick-ass season 12. Not gonna lie, March was a rough month for me. Not to wish my life away, but I'm kind of happy it's over with. I know daylight savings time here in America can be kind of dumb, and a lot of people don't like it at all. But I'm kind of happy to have some extra daylight hours in the evening, to be honest. When I lived in Hawaii, we didn't do daylight savings time. But it didn't get dark too early there either. And I was almost always up by 6 a.m. because it was so warm there I could sleep with my windows open. And the birds were up and chirping before sunrise. Which meant almost every morning the birds would wake me and I'd get to see the most gorgeous sunrises. I really wish I'd been doing this podcast back then. I would have accomplished so much more waking up early. These days I don't wake up till 8 or 9 and then I don't want to get out of bed because it's so damn cold. Find me on the socials as Rainbow Crime or Darkcast Network. And because I'm a coffee whore... I have a Buy Me a Coffee account under Rainbow Crimes. If you'd like to help support this one-woman researched, written, recorded, and edited show, I'd sure appreciate it. Or please consider becoming a Patreon member. For only $5 a month at the unicorn level, you'll get ad-free early release episodes. A unicorn named in your honor that I house in my Seabreeze Studio stables. And if you provide me your mailing address, I'll send you extra goodies. Join me in August at the True Crime Paranormal Festival in Austin, Texas. Go to the True Crime Paranormal Festival website and type in BEYOND, B-E-Y-O-N-D, and you can get 15% off your tickets. I can't wait to meet some rainbow warriors there, and hopefully meet some future rainbow warriors as well. It'll be six years in May since 31-year-old Shanice Harris went missing from Rock Hill, New York. 
She's not been heard from since May 29, 2017. She's our missing but not forgotten LGBTQ person that I'd like to tell you a little about. Shanice has been described by friends and family as warm, loving. She'd go out of her way to help an elderly person carry their groceries. She's a big goofball as well, and she makes those around her roar with laughter. Shanice is the one who gets the party started. She's also all about her family, and she'd use her favorite acronym regularly, F-O-E, Family Over Everything. She'd check in with her sisters and mom daily, if not several times daily, just to let them know she loved them. Shanice was last seen around 8.20 p.m., leaving her home May 29th of 2017. She was on her way to a friend's place. Sometime before midnight, she FaceTimed her girlfriend from her friend's home. And just after that call, Shanice was seen leaving the friend's home in Rock Hill. She was leaving with someone no one else knew. It was never noted if that person was male or female but that's the last anyone has seen of Shanice. When Shanice wasn't home by 9.30 a.m. the following morning, her girlfriend was extremely worried. She reached out to Shanice's sister, Tamika. Tamika went to the police station to file a missing persons report, but she was told she had to wait 24 hours, which we all know is unicorn shit because we also know the first 48 hours are the most crucial in finding a hot trail to someone missing. Tamika obliged the police and she called her mother, who was also Shanice's mom. The mom had just landed in Florida on a trip from New York, and she turned right back around upon notice that Shanice was missing. As soon as the mom landed, she marched into the police station to file the missing persons report herself. She was asked why she didn't come in sooner. Are you fucking kidding me? Tamika was told to wait 24 hours. Anyway, the report was taken. On May 31st, Shanice's car was found abandoned about five miles from Rock Hill, which is where her friend lived and where she was last seen. Shanice is still missing today in spite exhaustive searches near the area where her car was found. She's a light-skinned biracial woman, standing 5'8", weighing about 260 pounds. Shanice is masculine presenting and has brown hair, brown eyes, and pierced ears. She also could be wearing prescription Versace glasses. She has multiple tattoos, including one on her right forehand that reads Sparks, S-P-A-R-K-Z, and folded prayer hands on her left arm. Anyone with information about Shanice Harris or what might have happened to her, they're asked to call the FBI in the New York office at 212-384-1000. You may also contact your local FBI office, the nearest American embassy or consulate, or you can submit a tip online at tips.fbi.gov. When you first start dating someone, not always do red flags appear if the individual you're seeing has some sort of mental illness. For that reason, the first few weeks and months of dating someone can be very scary. It happens, though. Hell, some people date for a while, marry, and find the red flags after they tie the bond of holy matrimony. And then there's some that never see the red flags until it's way too late. For 60-year-old Tom Whitney, he began dating a 27-year-old man named Vincent Choi Chung. This man went by Choi. Choi fell hard for Tom. And you might be thinking, wow, CJ, that's quite an age gap between the two. And you'd be correct. But maybe Choi was highly attracted to older men. Maybe he had daddy issues. Or maybe Tom treated him like no other man had before. There was something about Tom that made Choi yearn for his attention, yearn for his affection. The two started dating each other in December of 1998 in Southern California. 
which I guess makes this a definite May-December romance. Only things didn't last until May. In March, Tom decided he just wasn't into Choi the way Choi was into him. You know, in hindsight, that sentence really had a lot of dirty connotations to it. I probably should just say Choi's feelings for Tom were much more intense than Tom's were for Choi. A few months later, in March of 1999, in spite of all the spontaneous romantic things that Choi did surrounding Tom, like little love notes and gifts that he left around the house, or waiting naked in the garage to surprise Tom when he came home, Tom ended things with Choi. Choi was 110% devastated and completely brokenhearted. As it turns out, Choi had only previously been in bad relationships with men. Tom was so different, and he treated Choi so much kinder. It came to the point where Choi became obsessed with trying to win Tom back. In April, Choi went to dinner with some friends. He told them how much he missed Tom, and he wanted to still be with them. But in the meantime, Tom had quickly moved on. He met a 51-year-old man named Lawrence Wong, who went by Larry. Larry was an established professional. He and Tom, both being musicians, had so many things in common, much more than Choi and Tom. Tom was a pianist, an organist, an orchestra conductor, and he was currently working as a piano instructor, which is something he so loved doing, teaching young people his craft. Larry, too, was a pianist. He was also a singer, and he worked for the Zachary Society for Performing Arts. Tom and Larry were happy together. A friend of Tom's had called him on April 15th to wish him happy birthday. Tom told his friend, Oh, my God, Choi's back again. He's outside, but probably trying to get into the house. Tom went on to tell his friend that Choi had broken into his home two other times when he wasn't there. Tom continued his conversation. He's obsessive, and it's a little frightening. I don't want to call the police because I feel like it would just be an embarrassing situation. Ah, he's banging on the door now to get in. Another friend had come home several times with Tom between April and July. Each time, Tom made that friend wait on the driveway while he pulled into the garage. He was trying to make sure Choi wasn't hiding and following them into the garage, but when the friend entered the garage, he assured Tom that they weren't being followed. Tom pointed out several boxes with gifts that Choi had left for him. In May, a female friend came over and helped Tom clear out his garage. This would include the many boxes of gifts from Choi. That female friend said half of the garage was filled with delivery boxes and envelopes sent by Choi. She also said that Tom used to have a hidden key, but he did away with that after the first time Choi got into his house. He also had the locks of the house changed. Choi's friends thought he was over Tom because he stopped talking about Tom after about a month after the breakup. They had no idea about the stalking and all of the gifts he was sending to Tom. In July of 1999, Choi began to send his friends things. A box of letters and stuff he had collected over the years during their friendships. He also included a very recent goodbye note to all of them. Choi had mailed a similar package to a friend who had just arrived home from a trip on the 26th of July. The package contained Choi's green card. The morning of July 27th, he contacted another friend, and Choi asked if they could meet up for lunch. The friend was wondering if they could do it the following day instead, but Choi said he wouldn't be there the next day. He was flying to Hong Kong forever, and he would never be back to the United States. The friend agreed to meet Choi for lunch the day of the 27th. The friend said Choi seemed pretty upbeat, but he did tell him about the older man he had been in a relationship with, and now the man wanted nothing to do with him. 
Later that night, Troy checked into a motel near his home, and he tried unsuccessfully to complete suicide. But before he did this, he called his friend that he had sent his green card to, and he left a voicemail saying, I did it. The next day, his friend called him and asked what he meant by his cryptic message. Troy said, I tried to kill myself. The day of July 27th, a father and his young daughter arrived at Tom's house for the girls' piano lessons. The father rang the doorbell, but no one was answering, so he tried the door. It was unlocked. He commanded his daughter to wait on the porch, and the father stepped inside. Hello? There was no answer. He walked a few steps in, and he saw a man's body laying on the floor and not moving. The father quickly stepped back out onto the porch, and he called the police. Police arrived, and they found a literal bloody mess. Two men were deceased. It was Tom and Larry. Two bloody knives were also found, and bloody footprints were all over the scene. The footprints weren't made with a shoe or bare feet. CSI analysis said that they were made with feet that were in socks. At first, with the finding of two bloody knives, detectives thought perhaps there were two assailants. But later they determined it had to be only one attacker based on the footprints only belonging to one person. The coroner who examined Tom and Larry's bodies determined that the time of death for the men was sometime the night of July 26th. Tom had been stabbed 36 times and Larry 25 times. To detectives and to us, the murders were clearly a crime of passion and very personal. Detectives looked first into Larry's ex from a long-term relationship. But that man had a solid alibi and his feet were much bigger than the footprints left at the scene of the crime. He was immediately cleared. Next, they looked at the people in Tom's life, and they found out about a 27-year-old recent ex-partner of Tom's, someone who had been stalking him. Police learned Choi had been arrested on robbery charges before, and he was now in violation of not checking in with his Pearl officer. They began to look for him. Choi was found and arrested for his parole violation on July 29th. When detectives brought him into the station, he had a small superficial laceration across his chest, and he told police he couldn't remember how he got it. When he was questioned about the murders of Tom and Larry, he insisted the night of July 26 he was home sleeping. Choi lived with his mom, and she claimed she hadn't seen Choi in weeks, blowing his alibi right out of the water. Thanks, Mom. The car Choi drove was purchased from Tom. Police inspected the car. Inside, they found a large drop of blood on the interior panel of the driver's side door. A DNA test showed that the blood drop contained properties from three people. Tom, Larry, and Choi could not be excluded as the contributors to this blood sample. The blood on both knives showed DNA consistent with belonging to Tom and Larry. At Choi's trial, his defense team tried to get the DNA tossed out. They said it was too complex to definitively determine exactly who it belonged to. But the judge denied it and allowed all the evidence to be presented. A jury deliberated for four days and they came back with a guilty verdict. Choi was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Rest in power, Tom and Larry. Our true crime quickie comes to us from Canada. Oh, Canada. It's an older story, and it's also a crime of passion tale set in 1958. Leo Mantha was born in Montreal in 1926. By all accounts, he was considered a manly man. He was tough and rugged. He joined the Canadian Navy, and after his tour of duty was up, he remained on in a semi-active mode, possibly a reservist. Leo also operated a tugboat for the Navy. 
and in the summer of 1958, he took a bartending job at the Empress Hotel in Victoria. It was here he met another Navy man named Aaron Bud Jenkins. Aaron went by Bud. The two men became romantically involved. They were together a few months, and Leo wrote many love letters to Bud when they were apart, almost always including the sentiment, I love you, Budsy Wudsy. In September of 1958, Bud just wasn't filling his relationship with Leo anymore. He tried to break it off with him. He told Leo he was planning on marrying a lady friend instead. Leo got angry and he beat Bud up. A while later, a guy friend of Bud saw him in front of the Empress Hotel. It was apparent that Bud had just gone through some type of physical altercation with someone. Bud asked his friend for a ride to Leo's so he could pick up his military uniform. At Leo's apartment, Bud was telling his friend what had happened between him and Leo. Leo, who was just in the next room, overheard everything and he became enraged. That night, Leo gained entry to the naval base that Bud was stationed at. And while Bud lay sleeping, Leo stabbed him to death. Leo was arrested for the crime and he wholeheartedly admitted to killing Bud. At his trial, the love letters Leo sent to Bud were read aloud in court. And as I'm sure you can imagine, the level of homophobia at the time was abundant. Leo was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to death by execution. In 1959, when Leo was convicted, it was merely a thought to abolish the death penalty. But that didn't come to fruition in Canada until 1976. It also seemed like Canada did not linger around waiting for stays of execution. If someone was convicted and sentenced to death, they got right on it. Especially when the convicted person was gay. That same year, on April 28, 1959, a little after midnight, Leo would be led to an abandoned elevator shaft that served as the prison's gallows. He was made to stand over a trap door while the hangman strapped his legs. The hangman then put a black hood over his head, and then a noose around his neck. The hangman stepped back and he pulled the lever. Twelve minutes later, the prison doctor would declare Leo Manthus dead. And you know, warriors, if this same crime were to have occurred today, Leo most likely would have not been sentenced to death. Well, in Canada, of course he wouldn't have, because they abolished that. He probably would have been convicted of manslaughter, or at very most life in prison as Troy in the previous case received. Rest in power, bud. And yes, even you, Leo, because being gay, I don't think you received a fair trial. Love you, Rainbow Warriors. You matter. And remember, it's not a crime to be gay. Unless you're a murderer. <laughs>